So this is a night uh, in the Ellerslie Chapel where we are going through three uh, Daily Thunder episodes all in one night, and this is what we've been doing in this season, and it's been a fun tradition that we have. I'm currently, this is the third of the three tonight, and it's in a series called Legendary. It, this series is focused on my dad, not necessarily just teaching you about my dad. It's actually drawing out sort of these life lessons of how my life was changed in and through my dad's life, even in and through his imperfections, even in and through his foibles and his failures. I have a very high regard for my dad, and I feel like God gave me a great gift in my parents. And I don't want to I don't want to diminish my mom in the fact that I'm talking about my dad. It's just that that's what I'm focused on is my dad. And a dad has a very, very special place in a family, in a home, in a child's life. And so it doesn't matter, you know, if I'm a boy or a girl up here talking, it's, it's, it's a significant thing. And the fact that God reveals himself as a father, I do not think is an accidental thing. And so how we encounter God first is through our father. That's actually our perception of God's nature is first formed. It's like the ball of clay or the lump of clay. And oftentimes it can be misshapen. And our perspective of God is misshapen as a result. And sometimes, like in my uh, perspective, it was a good shape. And it was very accurate in a lot of ways, but it was unfinished. And so there were certain things that were still needed for me to grasp and comprehend. Specifically, I'd say in my upbringing, mercy. My dad is a very merciful man, but it's interesting. His, he struggled to know how to communicate. He wasn't, like I'm a communicator. My dad wasn't a communicator. So he struggled to say things that could really help unlock me. And so like I said, in the last episode, we talked about sports but that doesn't always meet the deepest needs of a young boy in his development, in his perception of himself. Who am I? That's where this message comes in. My dad is going to have a shift point in his life spiritually. And I discussed that briefly in the last session, session seven, which was uh, what was that one called? Now I shouldn't have even said that because now I can't remember what it was called. Doing the hard things, that's what it was called. And my dad is going to go onto the mission field and his life is suddenly going to be centered no longer just around his family and business and providing for his home, which he was a great provider, great father in so many regards even before this, but he's going to turn into this man who is about the work of Jesus. That is going to have a significant impact on my life. Now, I'm already on the mission field at this time, right? but I'm still lacking some things in my inventory. And I'm looking on my shelves and sometimes when I'm hungry for something, it's not there. And I don't know why it's missing. I don't exactly know what it is, but it's a lack that my dad himself had on his shelves. And so he doesn't even know how to get it on my shelf, right? So we're dealing with a breakdown over generations, which is very common to have happen. And then every now and then there's a generation which is able to break through that and begin to restock the shelves and get the full gospel on those shelves again, and get the full power of the Holy Spirit there again, so that once again, there can be healing, and there can be a wholeness to the revelation of Jesus through a life. This particular message, part eight, is called the power of blessing. Blessing is a obscure concept to many of us. I would say we know in general what it is. It's like, you know, it involves someone's hand on you, and then they say, be blessed. It's like, oh, that's great. And yet for me, it's a very, very personal thing. And I see, you know, the laying on of hands in scripture is actually a very real concept. The idea of a hand is an impartation. So you could remove the hand and still bless. In other words, that's just a symbol. It's a symbol of impartation. In other words, I'm holding something and I'm sharing it with you. And so it's a giving action. And so one of the things it says in scripture is do not lay hands on any man quickly which is talking about church leadership, and you are not supposed to bring someone into a position of authority in the church without first running them through the trials and making sure that they have the character that is requisite for it, to make sure that they have the content that is requisite for it, to make sure that they have the ability to communicate and to teach the word before they are put in a position to teach the word. 
And so that's running the trials. And if you put your, lay your hands on them too quickly, which is a concept of imparting position blessing upon their life and ministry, before they've been proven, you actually end up sharing in their foibles, their weaknesses that can actually harm the body. And so we are told to not do that quickly. Of course, in the Old Testament, we have loads of illustrations of fathers actually blessing their children. And you know, we could read through the Old Testament, you're going to see it a lot. In the New Testament Christianity that we are a part of in our modern era, it's not as common of a thing. It is not as familiar of a thing. It is somewhat of what, what I could call a lost art in the church of Jesus Christ and in the families of the church. So this is where my dad is going to come in and it's going to impact my life. In fact, I'm a product of this story in a very powerful way. So the innate desire to give something better to our kids. So when we desire to give something better to our kids, what are we desiring to do? To see our kids blessed. Ironically, that would be a good description of it. There isn't a parent out there that doesn't want to see their child blessed. That We want to see our children succeed. We want to see our children do something with their life that matters. It's, it's hard to put words to it. We, you know, because the world will try and put words to it. It's like, we want them to be famous. We want them to be powerful. We want them to be wealthy. We want, you know, whatever. However, as a Christian, you want them to know Jesus and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You want them to walk well with Jesus. You want them to live well with Jesus. You want them to go the, you want them to go the distance with Jesus and finish and die well for Jesus. Yeah, yeah, that's what I want. I want them to change the world for Jesus. And so what I'm wanting for them is I'm desiring them to be blessed because that's what that means. I'm desiring them to have a blessing, to have the investment of God into their life in a practical real world way. Genesis 27, 18 through 19, very awkward story, I must admit. The whole story of Jacob and Esau is somewhat awkward. Okay, we've got a lot of stuff going on here. Okay, you have the hairy one and you got the plain man dwelling in tents. I've always joked about that at Ellerslie. Who wants to, if you had to choose between which one do you want to be? Or I always ask the girls, which one do you want to marry? Okay, so you could have the hairy hunter or you could have the plain man dwelling in tents who's obviously just knitting with his mom. Okay, which one do you want to marry? And I remember one girl saying, how hairy. So, but it's this awkward story where Jacob is going to con his brother out of his birthright, right? We know that. And then there's this blessing that's hanging on the line that is due to the firstborn son. And Jacob esteems the blessing. I'm not saying that Esau doesn't, but Jacob is after this blessing by hook or by crook, which is what his name means anyways. And he is going to clothe himself, what was it, like goat skin? He's going to wear goat skin and go out and, you know, his mom is going to help him. His mom was in on this too, which is really awkward. And they're going to make this, you know, stew or soup thing that, you know, that Isaac loves. And they're going to play act as if he is Esau. And I don't know how blind Isaac was, but something is off in this story. I mean, if my, if Kip dressed up as Hudson and comes in, I'm, I'm, embarrassed to think that he could pull that off. It's like, come on, come on. As a father, you should know your children a little better than this. Okay, that's all going through my mind. But we have to sort of set that aside to get to the heart of what I'm saying in this. And that is, so he went to his father, Jacob did, and said, my father. And he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. Again, awkward, right? I have done, because he's not Esau, he's Jacob. I am Esau, your firstborn. I've done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat my game that your soul may bless me. He craves this blessing. So there's two ways to try and gain this blessing. Now this story is gonna fall apart pretty quickly because Isaac blesses him. And then right after Esau, I'm sorry, Jacob is leaving the room. Right as he's doing that, Esau is gonna come in with his game. And he's gonna say, father, bless me. And he's gonna say, wait a minute, who are you? I'm Esau. And then, you know, his face, Isaac's face turns white and he's like, uh, I can't bless you. I already gave away the blessing. And every one of us is thinking the same thing that Esau is thinking. Don't you have another one? And yet he'd already blessed Jacob to be over Esau, to be superior, if you will, which is incredibly profound in the gospel because Esau is symbolic of the first life, the first man, and Jacob is symbolic of the second. His name is Israel. 
and the younger will actually rule over the older. And that is precisely the story of the gospel. In your life, your old man needs to be ruled by a new birth, by a younger life, a new life. And so it's profoundly amazing, but you know, they have to live through this whole story, right? There's two ways to try and gain the blessing. I'm gonna say it this way, to receive it and to achieve it. Now this goes back to two messages ago of the vulnerability that many of us have, like Esau has in the story. Again, he's symbolic of our first life, our first efforts. He wants to try and please his dad. He, he's trying to gain his dad's blessing. He wants this so bad. And so he is going to try and achieve this blessing. He wants his dad's favor. It's very interesting what he does because it's all gonna fall apart on him. Genesis 28, six through nine. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take himself a wife from there. And that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. Also Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So he has multiple daughters of Canaan that he's married. And he knows that they don't please Isaac. And he's watching what is happening with Jacob and he's studying and he's figuring, okay, Jacob, for whatever reason, gets my dad's blessing. And why does he have it? So he's trying to mimic it. He's like, okay, so we're not supposed to take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. So that means I need to take it from like our family tree. So he says, also Esau saw the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael. Come on, buddy. Uh, There's a better way to do this. But he goes to Ishmael instead of the lineage of Isaac. And he chooses, he takes, he takes Mahaloth, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebojoth, to be his wife in addition to the wives he already had. All right, guys, buddy, this isn't going to work any better for you. How many of us have tried to live out our Christianity that way? It's like, God, I am trying my hardest here. I know you don't like this, you don't like this, but then in our own effort, we try and gain a blessing. We try and achieve it instead of receive it. Previously on Legendary, doesn't that sound? I should have the Ben Price voice uh, for this one. Previously on Legendary. So, and we could have like a picture of my dad coming in and kissing me goodnight and saying, I love you, son. And then you have this one moment where I resist him and everyone's like, oh no. And so the kisses and I love you is the rejection of the goodnight kisses. This is all in a previous episode where I am going to push away my dad because I felt uncomfortable. He's kissing me on the lips when I was going to bed. I'm 11, right? He's saying he loves me every night. I'm going to push him away. Now, as I'm growing up, I'm going to miss it so much. And I just want to hear him say the words, I love you. So I have on the screen, the desire to recover what was lost, the request for the words, I love you. And so I am asking my dad in this church when I'm like 20, 21, Daddy, could you, could you please tell me that you love me? And then my dad's going to call me up. That's the Idaho phone call. And he's going to say, Eric, I love you. And that is a huge moment in my life. But my dad is going to do the hard thing, which is what the last episode was about. So that, I'm, we're caught up now, right? So my dad is going to say, Eric, could you come into my bedroom? There is something I would like to give you. So my dad, after coming home from the mission field, he's going to read a book. And I don't remember who wrote the book, but it's a book about blessing. And this book is going to so impact him that he is going to go into uh, sort of like a half, my sister's bedroom, which she was off in the mission field too, and like a study. So it had our, uh, our computer in there and a dot matrix printer. You remember those? And my dad is not a typist. So he's going to be like, kink, 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 kink. And it takes him like a couple days and he emerges with like one sheet of paper, right? And, but he's going to say, Eric, could you come into my bedroom? And he had four chairs set up in his bedroom. I was totally mystified. I had no idea what was happening. So the room, there's four chairs in it. There's a chair for my mom. So my mom's sitting there like, hi, honey, as I come in. A chair for me who's sitting over there. A chair for my dad and a chair for a box of Kleenex. Up to this point in my life, I'd never seen my dad cry. My dad grew up, again, in the formal version of manhood, where part of your strength is how you handle your emotion to quell it, to not allow it to rule you. It has some good qualities to it. However, there is something about emotion that a man needs to harness and leverage as well. If you've ever heard a man speak who knows how to have emotion but not allow it to rule him and sway him, that's a powerful thing. 
And my dad was right at the beginning of this in his life where he had never allowed himself to cry. The fact that he stuck a Kleenex box, I mean, I literally, I know you guys aren't as shocked as I was, right? Because you didn't grow up with my dad. But I walk into this room, my dad says, I have a box of Kleenex. And, he, he, and I said, what's this for? He goes, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this. And I'm thinking, what in the world is about to happen? I mean, I had no context for even what was going on. So the blessing. Now, I'm going to attempt the best I can to bring you into this storyline. These are imperfect quotes. I'm not a verbatim sort of memory guy. I'm a concept memory, which means I can give you the gist very well, but I can rarely ever get actual words. Now, I do have actual words from this that are, are still embedded in my mind. This is a very important moment in my life. But my dad's going to say, Eric, I typed this out. He's holding this sheet of paper. I typed this out so that I wouldn't leave anything out. My plan is to try and read this to you. It's a blessing over you as my son. I have this box of Kleenex here just in case. I need it. So the first line of this blessing. Now, if you followed you know, previously on Legendary, you know how significant these words are. My dad would say this word, this to me every night. And then I stiff-armed him. And I hadn't heard it for years. And then he calls me up in Idaho and says, I love you. And, but it wasn't face-to-face, -face, right? But it was very precious. I mean, it was amazing. It was gold for my soul. Now, right in front of me, sitting across from me, he starts this whole thing out by saying, Eric, my son, I love you. The second line, I haven't always been there for you. I was traveling around attempting to provide for you when what you really needed was my presence. You needed me there with you. Will you please forgive me for this? I am so sorry for not being present in those key moments when you needed your father. The third line, Eric, my son, you are a man. I, you know, you guys can see the movie Courageous, right? And hear about, you know, when did you think of yourself as a man? My father told me. I mean, I, I watched it, I did cry during that. Because it's very real to me. It's very real, this. It's like, so why do I need my father to tell me I'm a man? Can't I just figure that out for myself? There is something very, very powerful about a parent blessing a child. I, I mean, how do I put words to that? How do I describe it? Well, how do you describe what is going on with Isaac and Jacob? It's like, why is it so significant that a father speaks over his son? But my dad is going to literally do this in my life, tactically, awkwardly. He is going to bust through the awkwardness of this because you cannot get a more awkward situation than what we were dealing with there. It's like I'm sitting there going, what are we here for? What's going on? I'm, in, I'm like 20, 21, 22. I don't know, somewhere in that zone, right? So I'm like older. I'm not just a young little boy. And I had gone through all my cool years and you know, I, I'm trying to be a, a solid Christian, but I'm not that easy to deal with still. I, I'm still not the easiest guy to just sit down and have you know, a good father-son conversation that we haven't had for you know, over a decade. This isn't that easy. Eric, my son, you are a man. The fourth line, you are a gifted communicator. God has anointed you to speak to multitudes. I didn't speak to anyone. My dad is going to declare I'm a man and then he's going to declare that I'm a communicator. You know how powerful this is in my life? My dad, and I, don't, I don't believe that just a dad can just say anything, like I'm gonna say to Reese, you're an astronaut, and suddenly he becomes one. But a dad has a sensitivity to what God wants to do in a life. More clearly than anyone else on earth, right? Other than the mom. But as a parent speaks that and commissions it forth, it's amazing how a child is able to respond to that. What is the significance of this in my life, this blessing? There was, there was more to it. My dad talked for quite a while in this, in this one page. Still, a page is a lot when it's single space and it's you know, size 10 font. There was more to it, but that's what stands out to me historically more than anything else is my dad, first of all, saying he loved me. Second of all, acknowledging that where he had fallen short and desiring to make that right. Third, calling me a man. Fourth, commissioning me to a specific assignment in the body of Christ. Stand up and speak. 
God has gifted you, Eric. I know it. He has called you to speak to multitudes. So what is the significance of this in my life? It's one of the key reasons I'm strong in leadership. I've oftentimes said there are two people in my life that have greatly impacted me to be strong in a position of leadership. And that is my dad and my wife. Those two people have both called out strength in me. Like I can't tell you how many times Leslie said, you need to do it and do it like a man. Oh, okay. Well, how could I not do it as a man now after that? There's a powerful place that we have in each other's lives. And when we leverage it properly, it actually impacts, shapes people around us. So the Capel Cabin, that's just what it's known. Leslie would know what that means. No one else would. But uh, I think they even decorated with apples in the Capel Cabin. But my family and Leslie's family were all, we, we had a relationship. There was an understanding between us and our families went on this outing to this, it, was, it would be like an Airbnb type of thing, but it was someone they knew and they let us use their cabin. And so I I've never, was never there before and never there since, but we had a great time. Some of the, I mean, just rich memories in that time. First time our families had ever really gone and done an adventure together. And I still remember one night, and I don't know how it got set up, but I remember where I was sitting in the living room of the Capel Cabin. And I remember my dad coming behind me and setting his hands upon my shoulders. And he prayed, said, Lord, bless my son. Eric, you are a man. You know, it's, this is like formative stuff. I remember it very well. It's like, yeah, I'm the age of a man, but this is a commissioning. It wasn't even just one time. This is gonna become a multiple time thing and repetition in my life to reinforce. My dad is doing so. My dad isn't much of a communicator, right? Didn't I tell you guys that? Well, my dad is going into uncomfortable territory here and he's doing things that are not natural to him. His dad never did them to him. He doesn't know how you're actually supposed to do it. He just read a book, right? And that guy's probably guessing at it too. All he knew is that in this generation, the men are saying, we need to do something different. We're all a generation of unblessed men that never had the words of our father spoken over us. Well, let's change that. And that's the generation my dad was in very imperfect generation, but you're going to see a shift. And I don't know how many of you have ever had a father speak over you. And so as I bring this up, I could only imagine the tender wound that I could be uncovering as I do that. Because you're like, well, great, good for you, Eric. I mean, it's really nice to hear your story, but what about poor me? My dad's not even around any longer and I never did receive that. Well, I'm glad you mentioned it. You see, the amazing thing about the kingdom of heaven is where there is a lack, we have a lack filler. We have a gap filler. It's called the intercessor. What does an intercessor do? Fills in a gap. So remember the fatherless? What is he? He's a father to the fatherless. Can you think of a better father in all the world than God Almighty? So if you happen to not have a father, guess what? You have God. And it's even better. It's an upgrade, guys. Yeah, you have difficulties in this world, but you have a grace solution for it. So, simply put, if you never had a father who understood this, who knew how to do this, and you have a void in your life where you're like, Daddy, could you just tell me that you love me? And you really wish you could get those words and you could be called into your life calling. Someone could speak over you. Hey, guys. We have a gap filler and he makes up the difference in your life and it's arguably better. I know, you see, if you're gonna go toe to toe with me, I'm gonna say, well, I have it pretty good. I had a dad that like blessed me and you could say, yeah, but guess what I got? God Almighty personally took it upon himself to do for me what your dad did for you. Ha, and you have a good argument. You know, that's actually how Christians have to look at things that God always makes up the difference because you're going to have something you could complain about. You could. There's, there's things in your life that you could boo-hoo and moan about and you could be the victim or you could put on the Christian glasses and say, but God, I have you 
and look what you have given for me, to me. You see, this is the Christian life. It is never shortchanged, guys. A blessed man. So what do we know about a blessed man? There's two things that we know about a blessed man. Is both a blessed, but something's wrong with the grammar there. A blessed man is both, okay, I, can't, I just have to read it as a sentence. A blessed man is both a blessed man. I know that's profound, isn't it? But that means he has a blessing. He has been blessed. So a blessed man is one who has now been blessed. He has something and is a man with a blessing to give. You see, the reason why this blessing is significant is because it's the way that the kingdom of heaven works. Is God never in, intended every bit of the goodness of the kingdom to be stuck in the first generation of the church and then the next generation gets shafted because, well, they weren't the first generation. The first generation is supposed to pass on a blessing. They're supposed to say, here, it's now yours to carry. This blessing, this intimacy that we have with God, this calling up to a higher life, an empowered life, a life of love and kindness and goodness and faith, here. And it's supposed to be passed on, but somewhere along the line, the baton gets dropped. And we're all looking around trying to figure out how to make ends meet and how to make this all work. Something about the strength and the power of the early church just got lost in the mix. Okay, guys, sure. We grew up in a generation with a pretty pathetic church around us. Should we moan and groan and cry boo-hoo? Or should we trust that the same intercessor that makes up the difference for us individually where we're lacking a parent or a father's input and a father's blessing could also make up the difference for the church right now. Yeah, maybe we didn't get a great handoff, guys. Maybe. But do you believe that we're going to get shafted in this generation because of it? If we're willing to go to our God and instead of trying to achieve his blessing, he's like, are you ready for it? You see, I've already purchased it for you. You don't need to work for this. I want to give it to you. Not, on, not because of your merit of what you accomplished, but because of what he accomplished. Isn't it an interesting thought to think that God just wants to bless us because we're his. He purchased us. He loves us. And he wants us to be strong in our life. He wants us to be healed in our life. He wants us to be set free. Where there's bondage in our life, he doesn't want that. He's not cheering that on. He wants to set us free. And so technically there's no moaning, no groaning, no boo-hooing in Christianity. We're not victims, we're victors. And that's the mentality of the blessed. So I believe one of the reasons I was walked through this, that God got a hold of my dad to give me this blessing, is so that I could share something like this with you. You don't have to have my dad. You don't have to have a dad like my dad because you have a far superior dad no matter how you cut it. And he is desirous to invest in your life. Sure, it is God's plan that an earthly father would know his role. But what if you live in a broken generation where the role of a father is lost? That doesn't mean you are. God will make up the difference. Pictures that just say it. Picture number eight. I'll have what he is having. So I have to show you the picture here. Well, there we go. I love that picture. Now, there's, there was more to the picture. I had to zoom in because there's other characters. I would have been like, okay, that's my Uncle Dick, and this is my, you know, I would have had to do that. So I zoomed in, but that's, that's my dad. My dad was always laughing, always smiling. And so, yeah, have you ever had it where someone orders something in a restaurant, and you look over, it's like, oh, that looks pretty good. Yeah, I'll have what he's having. That's my dad. What does he have? Well, hey, whatever that guy has, I want it's my dad. He was everyone's best friend. Everyone loved my dad. My dad is Mr. Nice Guy. He cared about people, smiled at everyone. Yeah. What does he have? Well, guess what? My dad used to be more serious. He used to be in his, you know, tie and coat and polished shoes and at work all day and get home late at night. 
And then my dad was set free by Jesus Christ. And my dad suddenly let so many things just melt off of him. And he suddenly understood what it meant to be a child of the Most High God. And I am forever changed because of it. It's a pretty special thing to have a father like I had. Father, thank you for being the gap filler. Thank you for being the grace solution to every challenge we face. Lord, we have everything we need for life and godliness. We are not shortchanged on anything, including what we're talking about tonight, a blessing. Lord, we're vulnerable to self-pity on this point. There's a lot of hurting people in the church right now that might be listening to this. But Lord, may we not go in that direction. May we go in the direction of faith. May we turn to our Father in heaven and say, Lord, could you make up the difference on this one? Because I really could use the words, I love you from my Father. I really could use a blessing from him. Father, could you call out my commission, my calling? What am I here for? Could you speak over my life? Lord, I am so appreciative of the fact that your answer to that request is, yes, I would love to. Lord, I love how you work. You are such a wonderful God, perfect in every regard. And thank you for loving us. It's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray this. Amen.